um, as to how you go about managing this this COVID-19. Um, as you know, we're not currently operating so yeah, CC as such with delivery. So our lead coach, um, Ben Silver, has joined us today um, from lockdown. Um, he's kindly volunteered his time to join us for the, for the second webinar. And hopefully some of what you'll get from him today will be really useful as well. Um, as you know, Ben, currently on his advanced level three course, um, extremely competent coach. Uh, it's a good job he's not got the colour pixels turned up to be blushing there on, on his Facebook Live. But no, Scott's ben, just said no drinking coffee live. <laughs> no, no. Ben, look, welcome to our uh, second webinar, Ben. Good to have you on board. Um, now, we've got a number of topics to go through today, again, based on what we have um, received from our uh, followers in the final week, but also from um, a number of topics that... Uh, we've chosen to go through today. So the webinar today is going to run at pretty much the following uh, agenda. I want to have a quick look at the uh, a week in cricket, so look at what the developing stories have been this week and what the latest news is for you guys and how that affects you, especially at club level. We also want to look at a few mental practices for lockdown, things that you can be doing, practicing, routines that you can practice potentially to improve your mental approach to your cricket when you get back outside. I would like to touch on um, a few bits, let me just have a look here, on practice and how to practice properly. A little bit on coaching philosophy was something that uh, came in this week and learning environments. And finally, a little bit on private school facilities and should they be more affordable, accessible, for the community, I think that's a really interesting debate and quite an interesting agenda we've got there, Ben, would you say? Yeah, definitely. Um, it looks quite an interesting in, interesting uh, discussion that we've got coming up. So just to start us off, Ben, what's your take on the uh, previous week's uh, news in cricket, really? What have you taken from, from the news? That's um, well, the most recent thing that stuck with me is uh, the hundreds being pushed back, isn't it? Yeah. The 2021. Yeah. Um, it's quite a controversial tournament anyway, but I think it's a shame, really. Um, I, would quite, I would quite like to have seen it, um, particularly this year. I think it would have been a nice sort of break for everyone after this, but obviously they've taken the sensible decision to push it back. Yeah. It's an interesting, wasn't it? Because, as you say there, the 100 doesn't... Um, it doesn't necessarily define cricket as such. It's not a, um, it's not a measure of is it a successful summer or not? Because ultimately it's a new concept that's not been reeled out and not been tried. And I think that with regards to the 100, um, yeah, we just don't know. We well, One thing we do know is the huge financial impact by not running that this summer will have on cricket and how that will filter down. That waits to be seen, I guess, because it's inevitable and evident the ECB have absolutely stockpiled resources, cash into this tournament to make it work. So I think that um, the postponement was always going to happen, whether that was a postponement towards the back end of this summer or a postponement to next season as has now happened. Um, I think that's pretty inevitable. What about the latest on the club cricket, Ben? Because we've picked up on two different articles this week, haven't we? One suggesting that, I think Dominic Raab, that it's a long way back for amateur sport and amateur. we've taken that as amateur cricket. We've also seen the one of the world, leading World Health Organisational officers suggest that uh, a bottom-up approach would be better because it would be easier to manage the more local, smaller events. So I didn't know what your take on that was. Um, I think there's very much contrasting information out there at the minute about what's going to happen. And my opinion of it is really that even the people who are supposed to know what's going to happen don't. So. Um, there's, there's no real way of predicting what sort of cricket season there's going to be, if any. So I'm wary of saying I think this will happen or that will happen. Although um, I would like to hope that there will be some cricket this year. That's sort of my take on it. Um, and I, I do think they're right in that. Um, a bottom-up approach could be manageable, but at this stage, you just can't see anything happening, can you? No. It's tough to... I think it's tough to call 
all cricket off at the moment. I don't think that's oh. a sensible approach. I don't think that that would be the approach that the ECB will either want or um, feel is necessary, more for morale more than anything. Well, they, uh, I think the ECB should just wait until they're told by the government what to do. It's interesting. It'd be interesting they, to see how that goes. I am still told otherwise. I'm reliably informed by sources close to the um, ECB that um, the hoops and, uh, how can I put it, restrictions and things that would need to be put in place to manage this, going as far as changing the ball, every ball that you bowl, um, disinfecting players' hands between oh. balls. Um, yeah, it's hard to sort of know where this where it would end, isn't it, at professional yeah. level? <laughs> you'd, you'd, have to, you'd have to get away from that sort of requirement for cricket to start, I think. I think if you're still at a stage where you're saying to people that if you play with someone who's got it, then the rest of the team's got to self-isolate for two weeks. If you're, if you're still at that stage, then you can't do it, can you? No, of course you can't. Because, because you could end up halfway through a four-day game <laughs> and lose the entire team. <laughs> yeah. It just wouldn't work. So you, you, we've got to get away from that idea. It's not gonna, people aren't going to be disinfecting their hands between balls. It's just not going to happen. If that's happening, then you can't play. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, like I said, I think the ECB, the local cricket boards should just wait until they're told what to do when people know what's actually going to happen. It's interesting as well, isn't it? Because another thing that came up this week with the... Um inevitably when there's a crisis or anything like that there's always those who are there to take advantage of it and um, we don't know much more about um, some of the things that have been going on in regards to um, crooks trying to um, take advantage of clubs that are in situations where they're needing grants etc and you know it's um, there are some there are some sick people out there that will use this situation to take advantage of uh, to take advantage of and that doesn't sit right with me either and I think that that needs to be um, watched closely by club officials and if you're in any doubt as a club as to something being legit or not you know get in touch with your county board get in touch with those who are in the know because you can't be you don't want to be kicked whilst you're down do you so I think that's really really interesting um, anything else from this week in cricket that we want to go through Not I can think of, mate. No, it's been pretty, pretty cool. No cricket. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously it's not. Um, obviously, from from a w without plugging us too much, has been a bit of a development on our front, hasn't there? We've got um, we're going to uh, stream out a few webinars in the next few weeks for you guys. So we've been lucky enough to secure um, well, what is an absolute legend that is Marcus Druscothic, who's going to be doing a Q and A with us, um, an exclusive Q and A uh, questions that we're sending to him. Um, a webinar that's only accessible to those who who log into it. So it's very much an exclusive, intimate chat with, well, I, I know from from my day, a, a cricket legend from my era. And um, you know, as a as a seventeen year old young batter going through that summer of watching him on that first day at Edgbaston in two thousand and five was just something else. And I think that. So that is going to be an absolute fantastic opportunity for any cricket lovers, uh, anoraks, badgers, just cricket, absolute, uh, well, like we are, I guess, people who just love talking cricket. So I think that's a fantastic thing. Look out for that. May the 7th, that's a 4.30. Uh, we will give you some further information on how you can get your uh, e-ticket for that later on. Okay, so let's kick off with this. We've got... Um, we've got... Oh, I think we're up from last week. I think we've got how many's live with us today? Twenty something. Oh, yeah, fantastic! We've got Jamie Drake and Paul. Paul yeah, I'm pleased, I'm pleased the guys are finding it useful. I hope they are. Um, there's a few questions coming in here. There's a few questions coming in, Ben. Um, so let's go through. Um, now let's let's come back to some of these questions later on. I think I think what I'd like to do is go through our agenda because a few questions that I felt we need to answer maybe from last week that we didn't get round to. Yeah. Um, one of those was from uh, Ali Wall, who is uh, Kibworth Ladies Cricket Club, uh, and Kibworth and, and Ali, sorry, was asking questions about 
um, sort of mental practices during the lockdown and things that you can be doing. So uh, I looked at, I actually looked at this this week and thought, well, there's a few things as I see it mindset wise that you can, can be working on. So for a very simple start point, there's two top, <laughs> there's two types of mindset, isn't there? That, and I think they're very relevant to this COVID lockdown. Fixed mindset, so that's, this is the way it is, that's the way it's always going to be, no matter what I will do, no matter the efforts I make, no matter how, I, how hard I try, this result will always happen. I'll always get what I've always had, okay? Very fixed, arguably seen as quite a negative mindset. The opposite of that is what we call the growth mindset, and that's believing that hard work is uh, rewarded through effort and therefore performance, and that seems a positive um, mindset. So I'd encourage anyone that's watching this to a question, what type of mindset have they got? Now, um, interesting because you can have different mindsets for different aspects of your life. So um, in life, sometimes I think I can be quite a fixed mindset, which I'm self-aware of. Um, I think with with cricket and certainly a coaching front and, and back as a playing front, I probably had very much a go growth mindset, which was if I worked harder then I'd get a reward for that. Um, again, both have the positives, uh, but both can have their drawbacks, particularly on the growth mindset. If you're a perfectionist or if you have some bad luck or if things don't go your way, um, it's, it, you can lose faith in a growth mindset. Um, that said, a fixed mindset, whatever happens, happens. Every dog has its day. It could be your day. And you can say, well, that's what I've always done. And it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But the general feeling is that by being open to that idea of a growth mindset, that the harder you work, um, the better results you get, I think is a, is a decent start point. So I'd encourage you guys to think which one is you. Um, there are five basic things I think as cricketers that we can all do to improve mindset, either on the field, <coughs> in practice, before, during, in between games okay first one of them pre-performance routine now uh, you'll see i'll ask you ben here who do you think who, who at world class level do you see an extremely um extroverted pre-performance routine have you got anyone that you know good question i mean i'd say steve smith i think <laughs> his routine is absolutely there for us all to see um, if you watch the um, Australian, the, the test that came out on Amazon recently, uh, other platforms are available. But if you watched um, Steve Smith recently on that, he talks about tapping his left leg, tapping his right leg, tapping his box, tapping his foot twice, looking up, chin down, looking up again. It's an extreme example. But he knows once that routine is done, he is then ready to face the ball. Yeah, I'd, I'd say with him as well, it's, it's probably not something he's aware of. It's probably something he does before the ball. And he just does it. He doesn't have to. It, it, it's ingrained in, in every, every ball that he faces. He doesn't need to think about doing it. Which, so, usually you'd argue then it becomes a um, almost a subconscious routine. And you can argue yeah. that he's done it that many times that it becomes um, natural to him, doesn't it? In a way, mm -hmm. he's worked on it uh, long enough. But I think that the point with that, that's an extreme example. Uh, let's, look at a, let's look at a different example. Someone like Joffre Archer. Um, I listened very closely to some of the pundits coming in on him uh, during his early days with England and they're sort of saying before a game he likes to go and bowl left arm spin out on the edge of the square. <laughs> now, amazing isn't it that, that an international cricketer can do that but they're saying that he feels that he can almost downplay the occasion and downplay the um, enormity of what he's doing and you've got him there at a World Cup final on the edge of the square at Lords bowling left arm tweakers. Mm -hmm. And you sort of think... You not think that's just an enjoyment thing? I think it is. And I think that fair play to the coaches Good who thing, were yeah. around him, because I did hear, um, you did hear from pundits and from people around the coaching camp there that they were allowing that to happen because they knew he needed to be in that mindset to be enjoying it. It's a bit like, let's look at it, a club cricket on a Saturday who doesn't particularly enjoy warm-up they might be prepared as they see it with a cup of tea and sticking their feet up reading the paper. Now, we're not advocating that um, in any way, but there has to be here an element of what works for the individual. I think from a coach's point of view, if you can embrace that individuality, and it takes a long while to get there, 
I'm now in early 30s and in my early 20s as a coach, individuality for me wasn't a big, big point. Um, I, I had a certain way that I think that's the way it should be done. And I think it's based on the way you, you played as a player. That's how it should be done. These are my expectations. If you steer away from that, that's not good enough. Um, and I don't know. I mean, Ben, you're, you're probably <clears throat> 10 years behind that. Um, sort of from when I was coming through early 20s. How would you see that from your side, Ben? Um, I think providing it's, the it's something that's... Yeah, providing it's something that's consistent, I probably wouldn't have a problem with it. It's, it's If people started using that to take advantage of not having to do stuff properly, I don't think that's right. Um, like, I suspect that Joffre still does all the fitness tests, all the proper warm-ups. He's probably still one of the best athletes in the squad. So providing he's ticking all those boxes, go and bowl left arm spin in the warm-up. Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah. Providing he's getting all of his proper processes right, then him messing about on the square before a game isn't really a problem. Um, yeah. But if he was doing that instead of warming up properly, then that might be an issue. Interesting. So talk about pre-performance routines, something that's repeatable, something that's consistent. It could be on the field. It could be before a game. It could be in between balls. Anything, though, that can be done consistently that doesn't rely on too many variables. And I'm going to leave you with a little thought here. Um, I worked with a guy a while ago who had developed a routine before a game that involved having a net and a performance in a net. Now, that's great got to the ground, the nets weren't available. They were locked, I think. What do you do then? And I think that it's really important that whatever routine you have, that not necessarily it has to be, you can do it wherever you wish, and it doesn't have to be that flexible, but you almost have to, have to know within yourself that if I can't do that routine to, the, to my full capability, then can I still take confidence from doing plan B, option B? Can I still, so A, you need, an, uh, sorry, so, so number one, you need an option B. And then number two, do not lose confidence from having to do option B. Take it as a positive that you've been able to adapt. Okay. Um, other ideas to improve mindset, mental, mental toughness, as you call it. Um, try when you're, when, during the game, Try and take each ball as an individual event. I speak about this a lot, but I often say to the guys that I, I work with that if you score 100, that might be off 100 balls. That's deemed as average to slow these days, actually. But um, let's say as a recreational club cricketer, we'd be happy with 100 off 100 balls, definitely. Um, that's making 100 separate individual decisions well. That's it. That's all it is. 100 decisions. That's all you've got to do. When you look at it like that, the idea of scoring 100 all of a sudden isn't as daunting. Um, and it's the same when you bowl. If you're bowling under pressure, end of an innings. If you're thinking about bowling six Yorkers and you're standing there at ball one, oh. But if you take each ball at a time, look no further than that. That's a really good way of, of maintaining your, your nerve, staying calm and making sure that you're mentally prepared for each different facet of, of that over or that game. Okay. Um, final thing that oh, sorry two more things I want to talk about here before Ben if you've got anything else I think one thing that all young players should be encouraged to do is anything they perceive as a as a threat so it might be a nasty fast short bowl or it might be um, some form of sledging for example if they're coming into senior cricket or it might be a, a wicket that's doing all sorts you know you come in at 30 for five when a green seamer how many of you guys look at that as a threat and, and look at it from that what we say the fixed mindset and how many of you turn that round into a challenge and go actually i'm going to be the one that, that takes this on today i'm going to be the one that finds a solution i'm going to be the one that can solve this challenge and stand up for the team that's really important finally from from me on this reverting back to your strengths okay there's a saying and it's a, it's, a, it's a true saying and then it came, got passed down to me from one of my coaches it was from David Gower had said it to my coach and he said 
I think Gara got out for naught, okay? And he said, look, I've got runs before and I'll get them again. And that was his take on it. Okay, then probably reach for a bottle of red. But the point being that you do what you do. If it's brought you success in the past, it's going to be a strength of yours. And if you can stick to them strengths, take positives from them strengths, and ultimately know that through a combination of hard work, practice, focused practice, that you can rely on them strengths, that when it comes to it, when you're under pressure, when you've got that threat, when you're in a high pressure situation, that your strengths will kick in. I think that's a really big thing as well, especially we get asked a lot of questions, don't we, Ben, about you know scooping as batters, shall I scoop it? Can I look for the ramp? Great if you've practiced it. And I think the key is when you're under pressure, if your go-to shot is to hit it into the sight screen, hit it into the sight screen. If your go-to ball is a wide Yorker, bowl the wide Yorker. That is not the time to be moving away from those strengths. Ben, have you got anything on that? Yeah, <clears throat> just that last point you made there about um, what, what Gawa said. Um, to me, that, that's quite a good example of someone who clearly is able to grow and develop their game, but is still fixed on their confidence levels, basically. So they're yeah. still able to be fixed on the fact that if there's a failure, they can revert back to past success. Yeah. Um, so I, like you said before, it's, it's good to have but access to both aspects of your mindset in a way. Mm. It's interesting, is it? So I hope that was for Ali Wall. Ali, I hope that that has uh, helped you out a little bit with regards to what we spoke about um, last week for you there. Um, now, <clears throat> Ben, I'll, can you kick us off on the next bit? It's an interesting one because obviously you're you're probably playing a lot more than 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 what none at the moment of our coaches do these days. So, or well, no one is at the moment. But <laughs> um, just talk us through your views on practicing properly. I think that's that's a topic that's come up about practicing properly. Do you yeah, want to give us your opinion on that. Um, well, I guess it's it. It depends what you want out of your cricket, really. If you're someone who wants to play purely for enjoyment and not be too concerned about how you're performing, really, because there's plenty of cricketers that play Sunday cricket and, and aren't too fussed about anything but just playing with their mates, really. If you're um, someone who wants to play purely for enjoyment and not be too concerned about... Just heard myself talk, talk. that's strange. ...performing, really, because there's plenty of cricketers <laughs> that... It came out of your computer, didn't it? Sorry about that. Um, I think I think if you're one of those cricketers, then your practice may also be for enjoyment. So I wouldn't be too concerned about it. But for those looking to develop their game, um, so most of well, so most of the players we work with on a regular basis, um, obviously not at the minute. Um, I think the tendency at times is to revert back to old ways. So going into the nets, trying to hit everything out the net, trying to whack it as hard as you can. And I think a big thing for me when, you, when you're practicing is that the toughest part of any batter's innings is the start of their innings. And I think every time you go into the nets, you have the chance to practice the start of your innings. But we see a lot of players go into the nets and bat like they're already 49 out. out. Um, so I think on practicing properly, from purely a batting point of view, when you go into the net or a training session or whatever, you, you start as if you're starting in a game. I think that would be the, the biggest benefit for most club cricketers mm. is starting from, well, saying they're on zero every time they go into the nets rather than trying to drive the first ball up a length. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of bravado, isn't there? And sort of, um, it can be quite a macho culture around netting with lads. And I don't know about yourself, but the thing that infuriates me the most is, you know, someone that's just determined to hit the ball out of the net at whatever opportunity they get. And I don't think yeah. I quite understand the concept and context of... And, you know, and also, net. yeah, go on. from, from a, a bowling point of view as well, if, if you're um, just purely trying to embarrass the batsman by getting him out in front of your mates, that's, not, <clears throat> that's probably not going to benefit anyone's game. I mean... If, if there's a, a genuine competition and you've set a field and you're doing it properly, then fair enough. But I think often 
people will go and play in a certain way in the nets because A, they either want to whack it as hard as they can um, or B, because they're so concerned about getting out to their mates. <laughs> Particularly when you're batting against spin, I think sometimes, you know, you can do worse. You go into a net sometimes, you say, right, well, I'm just going to sweep every ball because I want to work on that shot. And I believe that every ball that this particular bowler bowls to me, I can sweep it. And if, if you play 40 sweeps in that net and he hits you on the pad once in front of all three, suddenly you're criminal number one because you're, you're not batting properly. When actually, that's probably the best practice against spin you might have had. So it's accepting the fact that actually, if I play 40 sweeps, I might miss one. Mm. But it's okay. Because actually, I've hit 39 really good ones to rely on when I go into the game. Maturity, isn't it? That comes back to the mindset we spoke about a minute ago. You know, my advice with that is, is that how you know, how, have you communicated that to the guys, the spinners that are bowling at you? If so, and they're mature enough, they should understand that. Um, and actually use that to your advantage. Talk about practicing properly. You know, crumbs that the amount of I know, uh, I think Jamie Drake's joined us today. Um, Drakey, very good, very good league off spinner, very effective at what he does. Um, bowls quite flat off spin. And me and Drakey will in the past have always tried to make it a focus practice and I will ask him for feedback. But, um, you know, Jamie, I'm trying to work on this. What do you think? Have you noticed anything there? What stump did I get onto? And I think that is crucial. I don't see enough of that at club practice. It's almost like it's, uh, yeah, bowl the ball, throw it, next one. Bowl the ball, throw it, next one. It, it just try and maybe slow it down a little bit as well would be something I, I think in, in practice, especially in club nets, is, is underrated. The temptation is, oh, yeah, you know, uh, I'm missing out on practices. Come on, next bowler, bowl the ball, bowl the ball. Yeah, well, that's great. But in a game, how long have you got in between balls? If you're talking about working on a routine and working on each ball as an individual uh, entity, actually, just slowing things down in the net isn't always the worst thing to do. Um, and, how, and you don't know that the bowler, if they're working on rhythm, it's probably helping them out, actually, having to wait their turn to bowl rather than just bowl, 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 bowl. So have a look at it like that a little bit as well, is that when you're, down, when you're netting, it's your practice. You know, if you're bowling and you're trying to hit back of a length, let the batter know what you're trying to do so that he doesn't think you're just trying to hit him on the head or chest every ball. So we've all been there with guys like that, haven't we? Um, anything else on practice, Ben? Um, I, think, I think, yeah, one of the questions that we, that we got last week that we weren't able to come back to, I think, was what practices can you do at the moment? Um, and I think everyone's just got to accept that normal cricket practice isn't possible unless you've got a net and a machine in the garden <laughs> or a, a long space where you can run in and bowl. So most people don't have that. So I'd say it, it's actually a, a good opportunity during this time to put your health, fitness, well-being ahead of everything else because they, they are, well, currently a very important thing in the world, but also for when you return to cricket or sport, whatever your chosen sport is, you know that you're going to be physically ready to go because you've had all this time to prepare. So I think it's a good opportunity to focus on that specifically and say, right, and it comes back to the mental toughness thing as well. If you set yourself a goal and say, I want to achieve this over this period, it's the best opportunity to do that. Um, so for me good practice would be treating each ball like it's your first ball I mean, that's probably a fair way of putting it practice with purpose don't practice for the sake of practicing make sure it's a smart it, you're practicing smartly not just for the sake of it there's a real focus into what you're doing purpose and take time to reflect. It doesn't have to be formal, it doesn't have to be written down, but it could be whilst you're packing your kit bag away. Everybody has to do that. Okay, what did I do well there today? What could I have got better at? Did I communicate my goals to, to a teammate? Could I? Yeah, and I think they're key conversations. That said, bad practice. I see it all the while. Um, in the nets, no pads, just gloves, um, with your mates, flip-flops, wasting times before session, so, you know, your coach isn't there. Let's do a load of keepy-uppies. That's practice time that you could be doing 20 catches in each hand. 
uh, and obviously poor preparation for sessions. So making sure that even if you're fortunate enough as a, as a club cricketer um, to, have a co- to have a coach, there's still a lot. That doesn't mean that they're going to do the work for you. It means that, that they put a structure in place, but your personal prep is stuff that only you can do. Um, I think well, it's a good, a good time, Tom, to come on to a couple of questions we've got here. Yeah, who have we got with us today? I'm just having a look. Uh, um, so I've got a question from Michael O'Connor. Okay. Um, what would be the coaching basics you'd need in your kit bag to coach um, age group cricket for a group of 20? It's an interesting question. Okay. Um, the basics of a coaching kit bag, is that what we're asking? Essentially, yeah. Um, okay, so for me, basics of a coaching kit bag, really quickly... Um, load of cone stack, uh, cone stacks. You can do loads of things with that to set out your areas, set out different parts of the session. Um, two to three <coughs> spring back flexi stumps would be ideal. Um, I'd look at some form of warm up ball, whether it be a reaction ball, whether it be a nerf ball, just something that's going to get the hand eye going to begin with. Um, potentially marker discs I think are very useful can be used for batters footwork can be used for field placings can be used for bowlers uh, marking the run-ups setting the um, uh, alignment etc uh, probably have a hurdle in there at some point because again you can use that for bowling yorkers you can use that for throwing drills at the base of the stump um, anything else I'd, I'd have a catching mitt I think that's really crucial to get good at as a coach is getting your mitting good um, and yeah, just obviously the I mean, first aid kit goes without saying that has to be in there. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much what what I'd have. Have I missed anything there, Ben? Maybe just a variety of different types of balls as well. Because yeah. obviously with a group of 20, if you're working at an age group where uh, there's guys who may be different, slightly different levels, standards, etc. I don't think that one ball for each is always you know the exact same ball. If you were in a class of... 20 10 year olds would they all be set the same work no they wouldn't be they're working at different levels so i think as coaches don't just chuck the tennis ball chuck the wind ball straight out with your 10 year olds they might be ready for a cricket ball and that's where as a coach your art of working out who's where and, and what that player needs is crucial and then communicating that to your fellow coaches is there anything else on that ben that you'd have in your bag um probably an old pair yeah. of spikes <clears throat> you've not washed for two years i should think or something like that. <laughs> Banana skin. Um, yeah. <laughs> Steve Flowers. Yeah, go on. Man. No, not that I can. Not that I can think of really. Um, I, I, I guess with a lot of the a lot of the work that coaches do with junior cricketers, sometimes can become overcomplicated by flash bits of kit. Um, so keeping it simple is probably well. It's refreshing, I think, if you if you can run a session with a few bits of kit, still make it enjoyable. And not have to make it about using certain bits of equipment. It's like the classic get the bowling machine out as soon as someone wants to bat without really, really considering the purpose of it. Um, Interesting. That's just one example. Um, and we've got another question now, unless you've got anything to add on that one. No, I'm just looking what the next question is. So, so I'll, I'll go. We can combine these two, can't we, from Cell Sports and Nick Beggy, I think, Ben. That's sort of... Similar. I've not seen the Nick Beggy one, but I'll, I'll come down to it. Um, so, CEL Sports, do you think multiple T10 games on match days could be the way forward this summer? Um, and clubs are already talking about that idea. Um, yeah, I mean, look, if that's a way of getting some form of cricket in, then obviously I think some form of cricket is better than none. Um, you, if you're going to do that, you, you you take it for what it is, don't you? Which is T10 cricket. It's a complete lottery. Um, yeah, if that's if that's what if that's what it comes down to. Now, the only the only thing I the only thing I see with that is what is the purpose of that? Is that to reduce the contact time? Is that to reduce? I, I think the, what more um, games in the day. I'm not sure what. I think I think the point is that. If the season is cut less than half, yeah, where you can't get every team playing each other at least once in a 50 over format, I think we're talking about club cricket here. Yeah, you can't get each team playing against each other at least once in a 50 over format. How do you get them to make sure they play each other once? I assume that this is considering that we've already gone for the idea of T20 and the season's even shorter than that, so it's not possible. 
because of you, you originally you'd look at the similar format to how T20s have worked in the past on Sundays with three games on a day at one venue. Mm. Um, and then I'm assuming that if the season was cut so short that that wasn't possible, what um, what they're saying is would a, a number of T10 games on a day work? I don't think, I think it'd be more of a fun thing for people is what what is what he's saying. Um, I think there's a real option to, to think outside the box this summer. Let's say, I think this comes on to Nick Beggy's next question really about you know, if we start on the 4th of July and have a full half season, should promotion and relegation be scrapped? Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, you set yourself up for a season of cricket and there is a saying, isn't there, that the table doesn't lie at the end of a season. Um, however, we've all seen teams in half a season have an absolute golden run or the opposite of that, do a um, Leicester City before the great escape in the first half of the season. So I think that could we could this summer be used potentially? You know, all these ideas that leagues have spoken about, about things like... Um, Win lose cricket, draw cricket, um, pink balls, yeah, pink balls, um, two day cricket. You know, one team bats one Saturday, the next team back the next Saturday. Could could this be used as a pioneer? And we actually go well, yeah. We, we're gonna we've lost half a summer anyway. We accept we're gonna lose the summer, but could it be used to pioneer um, future potential avenues that ultimately? clubs and officials will never agree to exploring because there's not the time or the slot to do it. So I'm not saying that's my view. I'm just giving another another take on that. I think ultimately before, I, I, it's really hard to spend too much time on this as a topic, but I don't think that until we get the go-ahead and the green light, there are discussions to be had then. But yes, there's arguments for promotion relegation being scrapped. There's arguments for different formats. As I, you know, I think... What both what Scott and Nick says are are there's some um, mileage in that. Um, let's do a couple more questions before we carry on. Yeah, so um, Nick, Callum, Nick Rig <laughs> well, Callum Rigby, thanks for that, Callum. Didn't realise you were so old. I think that's my lockdown haircut. Um, so Scott yeah. Nichols from All Out Cricket Coaching. Nice to see you, Scott. Thanks for joining us. Um, Martin, good morning to you. Uh, Chris Pitt. Uh, what's Chris Pick say? Okay, it's quite an interesting question, actually. Chris, thanks for joining us. I hope you're safe and well. Yeah, and yourself. Hope you're staying safe. Seeing you've been doing your um, fitness regimes, Chris. Excellent, great work. That really inspiring, pal. Um, different mindsets. Yeah, how do you approach a maverick sportsman whose performances are top level, but perhaps a lazy attitude, training, etc.? I like to think we touched a little bit on that, maybe on, on someone like Joffre Archer and his his maybe approach at times. I think that those who have followed cricket for a while will know sort of the Kevin Peterson saga, and I'm not going to get into that today. Um, that's perhaps a topic for another four webinars. But um, yeah, look, it's it's very much, I think you need a, a special type of coach to manage them guys. And I think that it's knowing that you have a, a coaching philosophy or a coaching approach, but also that what is going to be best for the team and the team in the short term and perhaps the longer term. I think that's where certain Mavericks will be tolerated for longer than others. And I think that there are a lot of mitigating factors such as time, time you've got to work with that player. Uh, is there a World Cup round the corner? Um, E.g. Alex Hales. You know, it, it, there's so many different factors that, that sort of affect that, Chris. But I think, yeah, I think that the... If you take KP as an example, I think that there are no doubt officials, coaches will look back on that and go, could we manage it better? Um, but they get to a point where the team must come first. And I think that if you are a... Um, if, 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 team, if, if the team really underpins your values as a coach uh, and, and the captains, etc., I think that's always going to take over. And I think there has to be an element of individuality and, and embracing that individuality without pulling away from what values really underpin that team that you're trying to create. Um, anything on that, Ben? Um, no, mate, really. I, th I think you've covered most of it. I guess the, the point with, um, with what you said earlier about how, how long people are tolerated for, I guess... Un well, not unfortunately, but there is a there is a direct correlation between that and how 
how good they are. Mm -hmm. um, like with the case of Peterson, he was exceptional at what he did. So, um, and, and no one can ever take that away from him. So therefore, I suspect he was given quite a bit of leeway on most of the stuff that he did anyway. Um, but I think it's the difference between a Maverick who's maybe, you know, like you spoke about Archer earlier, maybe someone who does something a little bit different in a warm-up, but he's still an exceptional bowler. So then yeah. someone who clashes with the team, I think they're two different types of, of people. You can still be weird. <laughs> you can still be weird, but not clash with your, with your team. Um, and I think that's where, well, changes need to be made, I guess. I think that's a fantastic point to, to sort of round that up. You know, it, as long as what you do doesn't impact negatively on the team and the culture and the, the direction the coach is trying to take. So, yeah, Ben, really thank, thanks for that great point. Hope that for that answers your question there, Picky. Appreciate it. Ben Stevens from Root Academy. Morning, Ben. Nice to see you. Um, All back be Ben Silver loves cricket. Yeah, Ben does love cricket. And indeed. <laughs> well, Beggy, morning to you, chap. County Age Group Academy player at Leicester. Morning, Ben. Um, morning, Will. Glad you feel you can join us today. Hopefully it's useful. Um, Got another question from Nick Beggy. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap these two questions then. We'll come. In fact, no, can we come back to them two questions? Sorry, because I just want to touch on coaching philosophy. We talked on it there a little bit, and that was something that came in as a question from last week. And I want guys to feel that we are addressing the questions that come in to make it a worthwhile exercise. So... Coaching philosophy. Now, it, as I, those who know me well, uh, the terminology of that is quite a lot of spiel. Um, you know, coaching philosophy as such. I'll put it in simple terms for those who don't really get that. How do you want to be seen as a coach? What, are, what is your view as a coach? What are your values? What are your beliefs? Simple as that. Mm. So don't get detracted with all the, the spiel of, of, of some of the talk that you'll hear. Sometimes that is basically what it is. Um, Coach the, way was it, the way it was explained to me, mate, when I when I first started coaching was, um, yeah, was, I thought it was really really good actually, was that your coaching philosophy is like a filter for every session that you do. Yeah, um, so that's what, what Crowy said for me. Uh, said to me when yeah. I started coaching when I was a, well, quite a bit younger. Um, but just imagining that your your session plan, every part of it, goes through that filter um, to make sure it's basically aligned with what you want to achieve. Um, oh, that's a really good point, and I think that it's a really weird analogy. But I was thinking about it. Um, I, I'm when I was crushing some garlic the other day. This is completely random, crushing garlic. But think of it like this: you put you, you all your bulbs are slightly different shapes. You put it through your crusher, it will come out the same, don't they? And it's very similar. Is that what you're saying there? Is is that you you have lots of different players, lots of different ideas, but ultimately you're trying to align it to one vision and one view. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a random way of putting it, but to try and get guys who do understand that sort of. What analogy. was wrong with the skinning the cat analogy? Nah, perhaps not um, animal welfare and all that, Ben. Um, <laughs> so philosophy is about what your beliefs are, what your values are, what your principles as a, as a coach are. Now, inevitably, that's most likely to be shaped by a combination of your experiences to date as a player and as a coach, whether you've watched sport, whether you've read about sport, and that will all shape what beliefs you hold in, in the highest possible regard, okay? Um, and it gives you that driver as to what you, what you believe as a coach and what your values are. So I'll share my philosophy in a minute, but I just want you to think about, you guys that are watching, to think about these questions, okay? Why do you coach, okay? What your motivations are for coaching and why you got into coaching. How you want to coach and go about your business and how you want people to view you. OK, there are four key questions to consider before thinking about philosophy. Now, my philosophy, let's pull this up. Um, I, don't, I don't need to read this out from, from, from my notes because I know what it is. And that's about maximising each player's potential through a combination of hard work, through simplicity and through enjoyment. And I'm comfortable with that philosophy. That's been my philosophy now for probably... 12 years and it's been shaped slightly and I can go into a lot of detail, but that's a condensed version. Maximising potential. I want players who work blooming hard 
Okay, I want to keep it simple without overcomplicating things. And if you can enjoy it and that can underpin all that, you're heading in the right direction. Yeah, I, th but, I think that's... Sorry, I man. That, yeah, I think that's really good, mate. And I think most coaching philosophies, when, when it boils down to it, come they come down to people having fun, getting enjoyment out of the game, people improving and people putting in the hard yards. I think that's, regardless of what way you word it, generally that's what you the outcome that you get and I guess the amounts that you you push those different aspects of your philosophy depend on who you're working with so with a group of 10 year olds the most important thing in that um in that session is probably the enjoyment aspect for you is that right is that yeah. fair but then yeah. as you go to say an academy player or a county second 11 player trying to get in a first team the most important thing for them will be either well the hard work and maximizing their potential they will become the most important things and because they're improving they'll enjoy it anyway mm. so that the, the sort of the balances change a little bit as you go up the levels you're probably looking at focusing on different aspects of your philosophy yeah. whereas with you know in a primary school session if you can get 10 kids to really enjoy what they do and maybe come back to cricket that's the that's the success of the session yeah and i think that the stage of cricket they're at you know are they developing or are they at that elite stage yet? You know, is it the participation end or is it the performance end of things? And I think that that pretty much sums up where, how you'd apply your philosophy to different situations. So hopefully that's covered a bit on the coaching philosophy for you guys in a very, very um, simple, uh, it's the Ron Seal approach. What you get is, um, what, what you get what's on the tin, or whatever it says. And um, that's our approach, I think, to that. Um, let's come back to a couple more questions, if that's all right. Nick Beggy's question's been there for ages, mate. Can you answer it? <laughs> um, in younger, in age, younger age groups, the mix of ability is always a big issue. How do you deal with that? Yeah, I think that's something that in, in a sport like cricket, Nick, and I think this, I don't know if you managed to touch in last week with us, but um, I sort of directed a little bit of feedback towards Michael on, on the rugby analogy and hopefully others got a little bit out of that. And I think that those who, who play rugby as well as cricket or football as well as cricket, they understand that it's very a lot easier in a game like that to be able to manage the large groups because everyone's moving, everybody's doing. It's not so skill isolated as such with standalone skills being done. I think in real simple terms, Nick, to get this right, it's about not being afraid to group your better players uh, not being afraid to grade it with your players, setting appropriate challenges, always have up your sleeve as a coach the next thing. Always have the next level of that drill, of that challenge. You know, don't don't let the player catch you out by you not having that next um, extension task almost to what you want. I think that's a good point, mate. And um, I guess... When, um, like you say, they're always having the, the next thing in mind is probably one of the most important things because if, if something's not going the way you want it to go, you, you can't be afraid of changing it, really. You, could, you know, we've all, we've all done it. We've all set up a session, started it, and gone, actually, this might not be appropriate for... Now I've started it, I've realised this might not be appropriate for the best player or this might not be appropriate for one of the less able players um, of this age group. And it's being comfortable and confident in what you're doing to go actually lads we'll hold that there and move on to something else crucial um hopefully that answers that for you nick i'm aware we've probably got about seven or eight minutes left just just around that so i want to get through, through a few more things next one uh, jack wood yeah good work chaps any more guests lined up for webinars yep like we said we've got um next uh thursday marcus Druscothic, who will be joining us for a um zoom webinar and as we said you can get your e-tickets for that we'll explain how that works at the end of today's session um but yeah and there's a couple more also that we've got ready for you um also to join us as well so hopefully that'll be really useful uh, another question ah, from from one of our sort of affiliate coaching families 11 cricket coaching um paul allen thanks for that i know paul really well great guy Check out 11 Coaching if you can, guys. You, you, you put some great stuff out there. 
Guys, morning. Hope you're well. I have two questions. What got you into cricket and what's the best advice you can give in as a player and as a coach? I can answer that very easily. Um, very much for me, um, the classic story, family, um, dad played cricket, uncle played cricket, granddad, cricket, badger. Um, yes, yeah, so I was born into it and I think that that is a very easy way to get into cricket now. Um, on the flip side of that, it, it does make cricket sometimes hard, harder for kids to catch the bug if you've not come from a cricketing family because of the time and the and the nature it takes um, up, you know, over your life, how much time it takes. Um, so I think that, that that's crucial. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not the be all and end all. I think there is some extremely um, knowledgeable and supportive cricketing parents who um, is what every club needs. They need them guys to get stuck in. And I think that that's really important because the guys that do get into cricket that haven't got family um, that have played, it's fantastic because it shows that they've probably done with all the best intentions because them parents have not got a, a playing agenda or anything like that. They're probably doing it for the love of the sport and love of their of the, of the kids that are playing. So I think that's, that's always great to see. Um, um, what's the best advice I've been given as a player? Um, probably to, uh, as a player, I guess be the one to be the one to, to stand up and, and try and do the job. I guess it's, it's very easy to look, um, very easy to look at others, isn't it? And expect them to do the job. But if everyone does that, the job doesn't get done. So be the one who wants to stand up. Uh, and secondly, yeah, like I alluded to earlier, just back back yourself, back your ability and back yourself and um, riding out the bad days with the good and knowing that good days will come around the corner. And I think that is so easily said. And I think wow. that I would love to be able to apply that attitude of 10, 12 years on now, 12 years ago, because it's the old saying, is it knowing what I do now, but knowing that the be all and end all isn't nicking off for naught. And I think that, yeah, just knowing the best players you see that survive over time and have, have carved out a long, um, elusive career almost is those who have rode out the, the the low points and the good points. Ben, do you want to answer that for you? Yeah, yeah. On that point, I'll just I'll just answer the the small part of that that you that you, I don't think you've covered um, because I think you've covered what got you into cricket and the best advice you got as a player. I'd say as a coach, then following on from what you said about the best advice you received as a player when it comes to backing yourself from a coach's point of view, then I think one of the best pieces of pieces of advice I've received. And um, I know many of the people have as well, is just that if as a coach, the only thing you do um, is make someone more confident about their game. That's not a bad thing. So I'd say it's, it's okay to do sessions where you work on people's strengths and make them more confident in delivering their, the skills that they're already comfortable with. Because like you said earlier, when, when the pressure comes on, you want people to revert to their strengths rather than trying something they've never, they've never done before. Yeah, that actually just rang a bell in my head. I think the best advice ever that I've been given and, and, and was one of my earliest coaches who said to me, Tom, you're a good player, go out there and play. And I think that, how simple is that, Ben? You don't need to read books or read, you know, do elaborate courses to be told by someone you respect who knows your game inside out to be able to say, look, Tom, you're a good player, go and do it. And I think that is a massive, massive confidence boost for any player who's been in that position. Um, <clears throat> just coming back to, yeah, just coming back to the point, um, Michael O'Connor's raised something important, I think it's worth raising. Um, I made a point earlier about not being afraid to change a session if it's not going it's not going well he's also said actually um which i agree with is if something is going well stick with it and keep going maybe cancel what you had planned and stick with something that's serving a purpose and, and doing really well so that's another valid point i think it's a great point i think that um you know it comes back to last week's webinar about planning sessions etc and you know, stating your aims to players and what have you. And I think that just be very careful that if something is working well, don't be afraid to go with it. I think it's a massive point. But again, that comes with confidence, doesn't it? It's like anything. It's it, anything that goes slightly against the grain and involves slight, let's be on topic, slight maverick approach where you go against perhaps the, 
the session plan or the the way it should be run um you know but, but good good coaches will recognize that i've seen coaches assessed or coaches advised that have, have, have moved away from the plan or their timings you know they they spent 14 seconds too long on one activity well look, i mean it's you know for me that's not coaching and i think that I think one of your strengths as a coach, but if you don't mind me saying, is the fact that it's that ability to adapt. And, um, you know, I've learned a lot from where, when you coach and, you know, if something's working, it ain't about you as a coach. It's about the player and getting the most out of them. And if they can do that, if you can do that and, and be confident enough in your own delivery and ability to go, actually, you know, this is working, so I'm going to carry on doing it. That, that for me, is absolutely huge. Got another question um, from 11 Cricket Coaching, Tom, as well. Um, Thanks for your time uh, and answering the questions. Uh, are you wearing any pants? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cheers for that. Paul. That's a brief <laughs> um, look, guys, I think that brings to an end our session today. I hope that those who have joined us have found it again useful. Um, as we said, we've got a few things coming up. So next, um, next Thursday, we've managed to secure... Uh, as I said, an exclusive Q&A with Marcus Truscothic. Um, doesn't need any introductions, really. Um, Marcus is a, is a pal of mine from, from the coaching side of things, and he's agreed kindly to, to do this with us. Um, if you feel that would be beneficial, please do join. Places are booking up quite quickly, as I'm sure you'd appreciate. And we will be having a Q&A with Marcus based on questions that you guys send him. So... Um, We'll have a chance to ask your own questions at the end as well. Absolutely. You'll get a chance to ask him yourself and ask him your own question. That's the idea of it. And I think that um, I hope you guys feel you can support that. And um, if we do support it and it works, we can look at running a couple more. I've got a couple of really, really good guys lined up after that. And I'm hoping that, um, again, if the response is good and the event's supported well, we can do that. But again, yeah, look, guys, stay safe. Keep doing the right things. We'll get out of this soon. Look after your families, look after your loved ones, take the time to um, reflect on, on your cricket and your coaching and stay really positive. Ben, is there anything else I've missed that you want to add, chap? Oh, th thanks for you today, Ben, for giving up your time because obviously, as, as the guys know, we're not actually delivering or we're not working currently. So thanks, Ben, for your time. It's all good. Yeah, anything else? Are you happy? All good. Great, guys. Look, thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us and uh, stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your day.